presidents, fellows and guests, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's with gratitude that I accept it, partly because the site of antiquaries has provided the central resource for this project actually happening. Without the vote of confidence of a three-year grant, I can safely say that this wouldn't have got off the ground. Although it says Historic England up there, this is something I do in my spare time. They have contributed to the project in kind, but not in cash, sadly. Um, so the antiquaries remain our lead funder. The group of us were brought together by Richard Henry and his extraordinary enthusiasm for understanding the context of PAS finds. The Portable Antiquity Scheme is obviously run for many years now, and it produces many fantastic objects. Very seldom, however, do the flows take such an active interest in why these finds are actually there. Richard approached myself and Steve to perhaps understand this a little better. Wiltshire, as we all know, is the heartland of British archaeology, particularly in prehistory. Um, the Roman period is somewhat sadly overlooked in many parts of this county, particularly to the south. On the right, we have all the little blue dots, which are Bronze Age to Early Medieval finds in Wiltshire. Um, the larger pies represent more finds for a single spot. The heat map underneath it is a mathematical calculation of the density of those finds. So, our study area in red is a very small <coughs> slice of Wiltshire. As the pie at the top left shows you, however, this produced far more than its fair share of finds. Now there's some biases to that. The big gap in the middle on Salisbury Plain is really fairly inaccessible for metal detectorists, unless they wish to encounter heavy artillery. Um, there are also certain estates that metal detectorists are not allowed on. Nonetheless, quite a lot of the county is well covered. And we really can be fairly confident that this is a genuine concentration in the southwest. So we picked our study area based partly on where the finds are. You'll see that we've encompassed the most intense area of find spots, but also a set of different geologies. The southern part of our study area has some South Wiltshire's narrow river valleys, the Ebel and the Nadder, but the northern part of it is up onto the Chalkland proper, and the southwestern fringe into the Clay Vale to the southwest. So it's a slice of landscape, to, and our objectives are essentially to understand why all this is here, what it is a what is it about this landscape which prompts the deposition of so much wealth? It's not just that there's a lot of finds in this area. There's some really exceptional individual pieces. The leopard figurine on the top left still has his spots. The leopard still has his spots and is a very unusual object. This little amphora is completely unique, and this solidus, although not unique, is very fine indeed. It's not just Roman objects, however. These uh, late prehistoric hordes came up. So the top one is the Warder Horde. That spans the early Bronze Age to the early Iron Age. And then we have the Hindered Horde of Axes on the bottom right. Um, that's the earliest Iron Age horde in the county, despite the fact that most of it's bronze. This is really Richard's area. So it's the deposition of wealth in this chunk of Wiltshire over a really long period in an exceptional manner. Having said that, the bulk of it is Roman. So it was to the Roman period we felt we should look for our major case study of why is this all here? This is our academic research question at the centre of why is this all here? It fits into a number of research agenda aims for the region, um, particularly understanding later Roman religion. Uh, a number of the objects from the metal detected finds were specifically and obviously religious, particularly the Roman objects, and Richard will talk more about that later. So it's elucidating the social process that allows us to understand why all the wealth is there. So if we're going to do that for the Roman period, it rather behooved us to look at what the Roman period was like in Wiltshire. The map on the right is what you might term the orthodoxy, an excellent study by Simon Draper, 2006, um, looking over the Roman to early medieval transition. Um, we can see that southwest Wiltshire is rather underpopulated with villas. It is fairly heavily populated, although the map doesn't show it especially well with the single dots, in large village-style settlements, some up to 100 hectares on the Great Ridge, which the road running 
west from Sorbia Dunum towards Bath and the Mendip lead mines crosses through. Southwest Wiltshire is quite unusual for the southern half of the county in its geology. You can see our study area here maps over a whole different set of regions. The big orange area to its southwest is the Clay Vales. Much of this was forested in the medieval period, and we have no reason not to believe that the same wouldn't have been the case in the Roman period. There are almost no metal detected finds from the Claylands, despite them being extensively detected, and um, very little archaeology in terms of burial survey, which you'd expect given how well clay doesn't show crop marks, but also very little from development archaeology that's Roman in date. Then we have, as I said earlier, the transects across the river valleys, and between them, between the chalk of Cranbourne Chase to the southeast there, and of the fringes of the plain to the north, we have a Jurassic inlayer where limestone, really high quality building stone, outcrops. However, this is the PAS heat map underlaying of the orthodoxy. Unfortunately, the main concentrations of finds don't look anything like the same places as the main concentrations of Roman towns, Roman villas, or indeed much else. So, we really must be fairly aware that part of the reason that's the case is we really haven't looked hard enough. Now, there is a great big monument north of Salisbury which draws a great deal of research funding. <laughs> Uh, most of you should be aware of what I'm talking about, I hope. Um, Stonehenge is a major problem for Roman Southwest Wiltshire. It draws a lot of academic interest. Even my own work, having started out as a Roman South Wiltshire specialist, has led me to be drawn to Stonehenge in recent years with Historic England. So, there's a bias in research funding. There have been big projects on Salisbury Plain and big projects in Northern Wiltshire on Roman sites, not in the South. So, we are underestimating the true picture of sites. Also, what the orthodoxy does show us is the concentration of shrines. These red stars are all reasonably well known to greater or lesser degrees, Roman shrines, all along the southern side or junctions of that road. So this is the picture that we had before we started. Really not a villa-based economy as far as we know, apparently a heavily religious area, or possibly just a bias due to the amount of crop mark sites there are, um, and a disjuncture between PS finds and the settlement record. We felt that given the emphasis on religion in the region in the Roman period, the emphasis on Roman period finds in our metal detecting data set, that for our rather closer case study to understand on a particular site why all these finds were being deposited, why all this wealth was there, we rather had to pick a site that produced religious finds of Roman date, so we did. Um, these mutilated coins are, as far as we can tell, nationally unique. Richard will go into their detail later, but they, together with other aspects of the assemblage from this part of this field, hinted very strongly at the temple. The field also happens to include major Iron Age hoard, major Bronze Age hoard, large number of interesting later Roman finds, and so even just from looking at PIS finds, Richard's able to give us a pretty good picture of what might be going on. We then sent some students out to do lots of magnetometry. Uh, they found that there was an awful lot in the field. This area around the Iron Age hoard has a very large Iron Age site. We can be reasonably sure it's Iron Age based on the curvilinear morphology of the enclosures and sub-enclosures here. Um, so we're talking about, you know, perhaps... 120, 130 metres by 60 or 70 metres area, so reasonably large. Lots of enclosures up here where our Roman find spots were, a very large ferrous-like anomaly here, which we'll come back to later, and then a little structure inside a circular enclosure, which seems to fit with what we know about Romana Celtic temples. Now, we felt we ought to ground truth some of this, which is where Steve came in. Steve, being one of our leading excavators and my PhD supervisor, also felt I should be writing up for my PhD whilst I was doing this. <laughs> so I kindly volunteered to come and run an excavation. Um, I'm now going to leave Steve to talk about this trench here, which produced a rather lovely temple. Thanks, David. So... Oh, I'm the wrong way. <laughs> 
So, as David described, um, there was a combination of metal detected finds in con clear concentrations. We did some work on geophysical anomalies and we looked then in the immediate area where those finds were concentrated and thought we could make out on the surface um, various masonry elements suggesting underlying buildings. That resulted in some very limited trial trenching which um, exposed roof tiles which seemed to us to be possibly articulated, uh, a slab floor and occupation debris on that floor. In other words, good archaeological survival which m made it sound like this would be an interesting area to do further work in, so more extensive excavation. Just as an aside, I wanted to mention here that it seems to me one of the ways in which we might exploit our portable antiquity scheme um, material more fully is if we had that sort of minimal understanding of the context in which some of these things are turning up. For example, this trench took David and I a couple of hours one afternoon to dig and from that we were able to show that these, these surface finds occupied what was almost certainly a, a, had a structural context. It would be f useful to know that for many of the, the Roman hordes, for example, where you could say, is this just a hoard in topsoil? Is it in a cut feature? Is it part of a settlement? It seems to me that that would allow the, the research potential of PAS finds to be much more fully exploited. Um, what I want to do in what follows then is to consider the general character of the building that we exposed, uh, the superstructure, say a few words about that, trying to understand how it was used and the processes of deposition within it, the modification, demise of that building, and some thoughts at the end about its plan form, which are rather, rather dependent on Richard's finds, so they lead into what he's got to say. So what we exposed in that more extensive area was a stone floored structure, which you see here exposed, which had been invested in, clearly those structural components are, are quite substantial and prestigious already. It had been um, terraced into the hillside. Here you see the, the drop, the natural drop of the lie of the land, and you can make out hopefully that the actual way in which this building is constructed has been to level that area. So there's already an investment involved in, in, its, uh, in its creation. Um, and you can also see quite well some of the problems of this site, that actually the archaeology is quite well preserved in the south, on the left-hand side here, but increasingly degraded as we get further, further north. And in particular, you'll probably be able to make out the scars of, of modern ploughing through here. So there's a sense in which this was a research excavation, but also a sense in which it was rescuing this, um, this building from, from current degradation. <coughs> when we started looking at this structure, uh, we were able to understand in some detail the differential wear patterns evident on the paving. I hope you can manage to see, I can't see on this small screen, but perhaps you can see in the, in the piece of disturbed stone at the top there, on the left hand side it's considerably worn and on the right hand side much less so. That becomes more evident when you look at it in detail and when you, you know, focus in you can see that actually on the right hand side it's virtually in pristine condition just as it had been roughly worked and then laid down. So parts of these, this flooring have been subjected to considerable wear, some parts virtually none at all which implied to us that parts of it had been covered. And that was quite pivotal to understanding the kind of superstructure of this building, really. Um, because when you begin to notice these things, I don't know if you can make it out here, but the lower parts of the stonework there are worn. The upper parts are almost in perfect condition as originally quarried. And they imply, therefore, that there is some sort of feature covering the unworn area, which we believe to be a sort of base plate. In other words, this building had a, a timber-framed superstructure, as well as uh, you know, set upon the edges of that, of that slab floor. More interestingly, further in the interior, you can begin to see the implications of this, I hope. Here you see an area of that paving with a central very worn area, and then area, two parts on either side which are not at all worn. So running through here, on the left-hand side of that, that uh, arrow, you see that it's unworn. And you can also make out, I think, um, there, the post hole with packing. In other words, this is part of the, the superstructure of this building. And then the area to the side is clearly worn. 
and that wear pattern runs along and then turns round to the right. And I'll also draw your attention to this particular zone in which a series of unworn slabs were jutting out over the front of the paving. And that's quite relevant to understanding the character of activities within uh, this building altogether. Not least because the area of that unworn jutting out lies opposite what turns out to be a really important point of deposition in this building, and which we believe to be a temple of some sort. And the implication is, therefore, that the, the slabs immediately in front of this ritual focus of deposition seem to have been covered by some superstructural component. I guess you can you know, imagine that could be some form of cult statue or whatever. So the wear patterns are incredibly important, really. The processes of deposition within this structure were of, of considerable significance as well. Um, we found some of the finds that Richard will go on to describe on top of the slab floor, but also aspects of them that came from underneath. Here's an example of this bell, a bronze bell being excavated, and it comes, as you can see from that picture, it comes from here. In other words, there is a point at which there is deposition of this material on the site, and then the slab floors are laid on top of that, and then further deposition takes place after that. So there's a complex process by which finds are being uh, put into this, uh, disposed of in this building. There is also a number of important modifications to this structure in the course of its life. You can see some of the clearest here, these sort of puncture marks, minor post holes and so forth, running down through the, the slab floor at one, at one point. So it's got, it's, it's constructed, it's substantial, but it's got a, a later life, it's for an extended period of, period of time. At some point, it starts to degrade. The demise of this building was indicated by uh, wall plaster um, of various types which had um, decayed off of the superstructure of the walls. We don't know what the superstructure was like, we just have the residual wall plaster found in, in the adjacent strata, but nonetheless, um, a process of degradation is undergoes at some, at some point in time. And then there is the its complete collapse, and you can see here uh, a couple of examples of stone, uh, stone tiles from, from its roof. So this is already you know, a substantial timber frame building with investment in, in its surfaces and uh, a tiled roof to boot. And then the later history of this structure, there is in the uh, post-Roman period it's, it's robbed. Then there is a natural accumulation on top of it, running down the, the, the hillside, so it's forgotten at that point. And then there's ploughing, so probably of the medieval period, certainly of the modern period after that. So it's got an interesting history in its own right. And to finish, I want to go back to look at its plan form. Here we see in heavy that purple lines, the extent of what we can be certain were, were the, the walls of this structure. In red is the in situ uh, worn paving, in blue is the unworn areas, which you can see are, are clearly patterned in quite important ways. So we believe it's a, a rectangular structure. We believe that internally it had dwarf walls set up in the way that I tried to sketch out there. Um, this obviously raises the question of what the northern limits of the building may have been, and we've been thinking long and hard about that. That's all ploughed away, so the only way we have of getting at that aspect of plan form is to look at the fines distribution. If you look at the, um, at that, at the information here, here are these little fine spots are all the fines that we plotted, and I hope you can see that there's a a relative absence of fines through there and again through here. Well, this, wall, this we believe to be the eastern wall of, of the structure and this one we think is an internal wall. It's a little bit clearer if you look at the um, sort of heavy that map of that. This is, this is a sort of heat map of all of the fines that we found from here. Obviously, they are very much concentrated in the in or in the immediate vicinity of this intrusive feature here, this, this rather important pit that I mentioned before. 
Uh, but also you can see here the way in which the surfaces seem to be kept relatively clear as we flow over here, um, kept clear as well. But you can start to pick out as well this seeming absence of material along here. So, in sum, we believe that we have uh, a building which is um, fairly clearly that spatial form with perhaps a, a, a wall closing it on this side. Whether it had another wall here forming the other side of a rectangle in the north is, is, is not really clear to us. And indeed, why should you necessarily have a wall on that side? This is a structure looking out over a valley which David will describe. So it's a, it's a moot point as to whether this, this site did actually have a wall on the south side, on the north side. It could be just looking out over the valley and accessed from, from that area. Nonetheless, um, that's what we think it looked like in its final, in its final form. And then they're in symmetrically placed with respect to those reconstructed components is this ritualistic pit with the fines which you will, we'll hear about very shortly. The last point I want to make concerns uh, dating. Normally with this sort of site, with this profusion of, of coinage, you'd simply form your stratigraphic groups and decide you know, what was the earliest date and so on and so forth. The problem with this sort of site is that actually the, the, the stratigraphy is so mangled by later, later activity, it's really quite difficult to, to definitively say these are from a primary context. So in the light of that, what we've tried to do in understanding the usage of the period of usage of this structure is to look at the coin assemblage as an assemblage. And that seems to present the following argument that uh, this seems to be being built in the first half, perhaps towards the middle of the third century, based on, um, again, Richard can, can fill in the details, two particular coins, the earliest being of Julia Mamea, uh, 221 to 222, and perhaps more diagnostically, an unworn version of quite a rare coin of, of Gordian III, 238 to 244, and given that that's unworn and so forth. So the, the implication of that seems to be towards the middle of the third century is when this building is first constructed. And when we looked at the groupings of all the modifications that I mentioned before of this building, it was quite clear that coinage from uh, Richard Rees's period 17, in other words um, 330 to 348, were particularly focused in the, in the modifications to this structure. Implication may be that they took place about 100 years later than the point at which it was uh, originally constructed. So have a building that's built in the middle of the third, seems to be used, perhaps kept quite clean, but undergo modification in the middle, uh, towards the middle of the fourth century AD. But the other implication of the coinage, though, is that it's, there's no, as I understand it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, uh, there's no indication that this has a long trajectory of deposition of coinage, at least, into the post roman period, into the, into the fifth century. So that is the structure that we were working away from. Over to you. So what I was going to talk about today was the, the metal detecting and the excavation assemblage from the site because considering how plough damaged the site is, if you only consider the items that we had from the excavation, you would only get a fraction of the picture. Um, and what I was going to focus on was the, the coin assemblage, then the mutilated coins, the miniature objects, and the curse tablets that we've had from the site. We do have a range of other really interesting find types, but in 15 minutes I can't really talk about everything. So I thought that I'd focus on the things that perhaps give us the best insight into the site in general. And so what I decided to do was give everybody a really exciting graph. Um, so what you can see here is evidence of what's going on at the site through the coins. And so what we do is, through Reese period analysis, we can understand what is happening at the site and then compare it to other areas. And so in comparison to the South Wiltshire mean, which is the average from the Portable Antiquities Scheme from South Wiltshire, you can see that there are very few coins from the excavation and from the metal detectors assemblage combined from the early period. And 
even when we start seeing a greater number of fines deposited in Reese period 13, which is from 260 to 275, it's still far below the average that we see for the area. Whereas in contrast, 75% of the coins come from the middle of the 4th century, especially, I suppose, the unusual aspect in terms of metabotecular assemblages is the fact that we get so many coins from Reese period 18, which is from 348 to 364. But this is an element that we see at a lot of temples in the country. And then the last point to highlight, I suppose, is the fact that, as Steve mentioned, we do not see very many coins from the site after 383. And this is in direct contrast to kind of the wider area. So within a few hundred metres, we've got coins as late as 406. So it does suggest that the site does end before the end of the 4th century. What you can see here is the fact that the vast majority of the coins are highlighted around the central pit and as was mentioned the, kind of the main areas of flooring are kept pretty clean. Um, but it does also then highlight the fact that over here you do have an area that's been completely disturbed. But the, the element that I suppose is the most interesting in terms of what I deal with is the fact that we have 79 mutilated coins. And to begin with, we saw them as kind of part of the assemblage of coins themselves, whereas actually I suspect that they're far more likely to be associated with the miniature objects. We had two general types, types which have been clasped, so iron objects have been wrapped round the coins, and then other coins that have been pierced in the centre or in other locations, and then uh, an iron nail has been inserted through, or a tack. And so the two examples we have here are both miniature spears. Um, the one on the left-hand side dates from 348 to 350, whereas the one on the right is slightly earlier. And I suppose one of the things to highlight, especially in contrast with the mutilated iron, uh, sorry, the iron assemblage that we'll see in a minute, is that the copper objects have been pierced with iron tacks or nails. And so what I wanted to do was to try and understand whether the mutilated coin assemblage tied in with what we actually see from the site in general through coinage, or whether there is a difference. And so with the pierced assemblage, which is the, you can see that the vast majority do follow the general trends that you see. We have more pierced coins from Reese period 15, for example, than we have coins in general, but it's also important to remember that they are slightly bigger, so it is generally, generally easier to actually pierce them. The element that is far more unusual is the coins that have been clasped, and I think this in many ways highlights the, the main change that we see through the mutilated assemblage, and it ties in really quite nicely with the modifications from the temple in general. And after 364, we see only one example of a class coin, and the number of mutilated coins does decrease as well. But it, in general, the pierced coins do follow the general practice that we see of coin deposition from the, from the site. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the mutilated coins are from the metal detected assemblage, and so it doesn't give us the greatest insight into <coughs> when we try and plot them. But the element that I find quite interesting is the fact that the vast, not all of them are from the central pit, and there's some others from around the area of the dwarf, uh, the dwarf walls. What we do have, though, is the what I believe to be the largest miniature iron uh, assemblage anywhere in the country, and it includes the largest miniature sword from, <coughs> I think, the Roman Empire. Um, and it's been decorated, or it has ivory terminals, which is here and here, and then copper alloy wire going down the centre. We also have a number of other miniature objects, including significant assemblage of miniature spears and hammers and also padlocks and axes and if you see just here 
with the, some of the items that have been conserved so far, we're actually having iron objects that have then been mutilated and you can just about see a dot there, which is where it's been pierced with uh, copper alloy, which took me by surprise when we first saw it. And so hope for the next uh, stage of the evaluation is to have more x-rays undertaken so that we can see if other objects have been mutilated in that way. But we also have 13 spears and one hammer where there are coins attached and all of these items date from between 348 to 364. But it's not just the, the temple that has this interesting iron assemblage. From the site as a whole, we have the largest cross pain hammer from the country, and then we have a significant, what you could describe as a set, I suppose, of miniatures that go from around about 10 centimetres for the hammer's head to the smallest cross pain hammer from the country as well. So we have the biggest and the smallest, and you can see it on the far right, hand, bottom right hand corner. And Based on the evidence that we have from the mutilated coin assemblage, I would argue that the vast majority of these miniatures date from 330 to 364. It's potential that they can be slightly later, but I think the fact that all of the um, objects that have coins attached date from around this period, I think it is likely that they're going to be from here as well. And this is the distribution of the miniature objects from the site. And you can see that the vast majority are from the area of the central pit. And one of the elements that I would like to look at in the future is to see whether they uh, lie on top or underneath of the paving slabs. And that's one of the things we will look at. But what I really wanted to do, and um, I think part of it was the fact that it sounded fun, was to try and understand a bit more about why they were being made in the first place. Because when we first discovered them, I wondered whether they were likely to be miniature objects or votive objects. And you can argue that uh, they can be one of the same. But all of the hammers that we found at the excavation, you could argue, could be used. And so it's tried to understand the processes behind it. So we collected iron ore from the site. And then a group of us started smelting the iron to create a bloom uh, with the help of Jake Keen, an experimental iron smelter. And I'm afraid to say it turns out that we're just not very good at iron smelting. Um, we, we had uh, two failed smelts, and it's just because the quality of the ore, although it was good, it wasn't good enough at this point in time, uh, and what we were collecting wasn't good enough to create a bloom. But when we had success, we then contacted Hector Cole, who's an experimental blacksmith, and he creates a lot of replicas for places like the um, different museums and also the Mary Rose. And so we went about trying to understand kind of the quality of the ore in general, and then what we'd need to do and what you could get, and how long it would take to make each of these miniatures. And the iron is in an incredibly high quality, which he was <laughs> real pains to stress, was that it was a dream to work with in comparison to some of the other ores that he has worked with. And so to do that, we, we went from creating a bloom and then turning it into a bar. And by the time that we'd reduced the kilo bloom to the bar, we'd lost around about 50% of the iron. And so we were ended up with an incredibly pure iron, which he was then able to work with. And although there are limitations to the experiments because we were trying to um, make exact replicas of some of the items, where if I said to him, I'd like you to just make a miniature hammer. It's interesting, the amount of smelt it uh, took and also the amount of time makes it these items that actually take a lot of investment. Um, so the hammer on the left hand side took uh, around about 50 minutes to make and he ended up breaking a couple of things because the, to tr create the perforation you had to, um, he ended up welding what he was trying to pierce the hole with in the first place. Um, so I think it highlights that although they are miniatures, um, I suspect the reality is that they, 
are also um, something that you wouldn't kind of create as trinkets, I suppose. They're not something that you would have made quickly um, to for deposition at the temple. Instead, you have items that would have taken a lot of work. And the way that he described it to me is like when you are kind of training to be an apprentice, you have to make lots of little small things. And it's interesting that the amount of iron that we have from our experiments created a very small amount of um, workable tools in the end. So, for example, the, the hammer that you can see at the bottom, if we were to make one, uh, it would take us four smelts um, to actually get enough iron to actually produce it in the first place. And although you could be arguing that these are a usable set of miniatures, I still think that um, they're being deposited in the temple for a different reason. And it's, I think the, the way that I would argue is that they are being created by somebody almost like you would do if you were kind of creating small items for an apprenticeship. And from looking at it, none of the items show any evidence of use. Um, so William Manning and I had a look through, and um, they do all appear to be pristine. And the final argument, I suppose I would say, about why that they are not likely to be usable tools in this context is the fact that the vast majority of hammers don't usually have an iron handle, whereas these do. And quite a few of the examples also have loops at the bottom, which you can't see in this picture. Um, so they're being produced for a range of different reasons. And then from the site, we have a total of nine cursed tablets. Um, the vast majority are incredibly fragmentary, and they're often, I think, one of, the, one of them is in about 30 pieces. And a minimum of three are inscribed in Old Roman cursive. And one tablet has been wrapped around an iron nail. And the analysis is being done by Dr. Arthur Tomlin. So far, we have the report for the first Hearst tablet that was uh, deposited, and it's on the right hand side here. And the, there are a couple of words that um, aren't instantly translatable, and it's Dexter, I suppose, is the one that does kind of create an interesting element for the site because at the time we weren't sure what it meant, but Two of the later cursed tablets have um, the first uh, use of the words axe and hammer from, the, uh, from Roman Britain. And so in this context, it's likely that Dexter is likely to mean hatchet. Um, but <coughs> most intriguingly, we do have a cursed tablet that has been uh, dedicated to a god, and the god appears to be called Regnius, which is not somebody who's instantly recognisable. Um, but that is still something that's kind of the work in progress. And the unusual element, I suppose, about this cursed tablet is that it's been written and then um, it's been deposited on upside down um, because the, the perforation's actually at the bottom there. So. It's still an element that we're waiting for the final report on, but an intriguing element is the fact that between um, Old Roman cursive is usually kind of dates to around about 150 to 250. So if these items do follow that rule, you've got uh, curse tablets that were deposited at, at the very start of when this temple was being built. And actually, I would have thought that it was more likely to be fourth century. So it does kind of create interesting questions for the future. And I'll pass you over to David now. Right, now my brief from, for the final little bit of this was to draw all that together somehow. Um, there are other finds, other than small finds from the temple. They are extremely interesting, particularly the fauna remains, in that there are very few of them. There are approximately one third of the number of animal bones by, well, a weight of animal bones as there is of oyster shell which is bizarre. There are no cows, which is also very strange. We have one cow bone from topsoil. There is a distinct flavour of wild in our animal bone assemblage from this part of the site. The settlement downhill, which is industrial and domestic, is much more normal. Cows, sheep, that kind of thing. Whereas here we have antler, still attached to skull, um, which was found when block lifted to have a couple of little hooks underneath, which I rather like the idea of holding it up. 
within the inner room. In terms of depositional practice, yes, there is a vast amount of metal wealth being deposited in this little room, in the very centre of it, but there's also a lot of oyster being deposited. Um, unusually, we have fish, we have moorhen, we have duck, mice, frog, deer, various wild things. The rest of the site, the pottery assemblage, is quite local, big door BD1, whereas in the temple, it's very little local, that's the tiny dark blue wedge. Door BB wanted the enormous red wedge, and then various other British wares. Almost no continental pottery whatsoever. So there's a really distinct set of objects being used. The temple itself, movement is key. It's very constricted. The unworn area Steve showed means that someone walking along that little path in the central room, if they're my size and I'm not enormous, has to walk like this. That's very hard. This is a very controlled space. People are excluded. They can see the outside of the temple from the settlement in the coombe below it, but they can't see what's going on inside. These unworn areas that seem to block off the focus of deposition from that little tight path in are intriguing. What are those? Are those wooden dwarf walls? Are they full screens? We really need to look deeper into the detail of the finds deposition in the pit to find that out. This is a maintained space. It's clean. There are barely any finds from the outer room, uh, very little finds from the top of the paving, except for in its abandonment phase. There's clearly a selection going on. There's particular animals, wild, particular plants. Bizarrely, the uh, most prevalent seed in the archibotanical assemblage was mustard. Now, burning mustard seed produces a noxious, painful, stinging smell, um, and very little else. Um, we think that's something to do with the artificial creation of a ritual space in the centre. It's presumably fairly dark. So, as a normal resident of this area, going into this place, it would have a major impact on you. You would be in the darkness, you wouldn't be able to move properly. You would be taking your wealth to deposit, and you would be doing that in a way controlled by somebody else. Now, what does all that actually mean? So we've got this highly ritualised space of a very particular chronological period in the mid-4th century and then leading up to that. Well, we've got a cluster of shrines in southern Wiltshire coming off this road. At one level of resolution, there's elite movements presumably going across that road and movements of other people too. Perhaps they'd have visited this place, which isn't marked on this map, obviously, because of the sensitivity of the location. Perhaps they have visited all these places. But why? Why are all those shrines there? I think they're encountering rather local power dynamics. Now, we said earlier that there aren't many villas down here. That, I'm pretty sure now, is a factor of, we just haven't looked. There's barely any commercial archaeology in this western part of Wiltshire because there's barely any commercial development. As we discussed earlier, there's very little research into the Roman period. Lots of commercial research around Salisbury and Amesbury. Sadly, that's too far away from us. Now, another past landscape site was this one at the top. We rather stumbled across quite a large villa in 2015. Um, this is our reconstruction, not the one you'll have seen in the newspapers. Um, that is only the bits we're archaeologically sure of. That's in the Deverell Valley, which is up here. Given the finds concentrations elsewhere in that valley, I'm pretty sure there are at least a couple more. So this isn't so much a landscape without villas as without villas we've found yet. Also, so if we have a large forest here, an elite pursuit in the Roman period, particularly the late Roman period, for displays of martial prowess, using spears, etc., is hunting. We have antlers, we have spears. There is certainly a hunting element to the identity being expressed at this temple. But we need to look at a more local context to understand why this temple is so much more elaborated than the other shrines on that road route. And Richard obliquely referred to it earlier. This field is full of iron ore and good iron ore. It's also got a great big Roman furnace in it. <laughs> now, if you've got large scale, and this is one of several furnaces, albeit by far the best preserved, large-scale Roman ironworking, a series of unusual, if not unique, miniature iron objects in a temple at the top of the coombe overlooking the domestic landscape. This is where the exceptional 
aspect of this particular landscape place comes from. There are other shrines along this road, and at those where we've looked at them, we find different types of wealth articulated. Some very rural, lots of animal sacrifice, lots of grain, whereas here it's the metalwork that it's important. And the, uh, the ability to manipulate supplies of iron to create particular objects, and often very elite focused objects, spears, swords, etc., would have been of great importance in this late unstable part of the Roman period to local elites such as those living at that villa there, only a few miles away. So I think it's here that we locate the specific importance of the shrine. Now, the odd thing about it is that it sort of springs up in the mid-third century. Brignus, if that is the god to which it's dedicated, it seems he is. Well, I mean, that's a very British name. But there's no underlying shrine. There's an Iron Age settlement very close by. Nothing there on geophysics that morphologically looks like a shrine. It's a bit odd. Maybe there's a tradition of this Bregnius, but part of me thinks that it is a, as much an elite manipulation of a tradition to create this temple, which requires considerable investment by those controlling the ironworking site, as it is a real expression of religious belief. It's a way of articulating elite identity to those moving along the road and expressing elite power in the local landscape to those working in it and passing through it. So to answer our original question, yes, we can elucidate the social processes behind the deposition of extraordinary assemblages, but you need to look at all of these scales to do it, and you need to look at the particular temporal context as well. Late Romano-British elites in this region need to articulate their power in a different way to they did in the early Roman period, and I think that's why this temple's here. Finally, I'd like to thank all our many sponsors who have put money into this, or are the helping kind, and our team, without whom we couldn't have done it. Thank you for listening.